Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. Today, our guest is Dr. Kenneth Doka, is a professor emeritus at the Graduate School of the City College of New Rochelle and senior consultant to the Hospice Foundation of America. A prolific author, Dr. Doka's new book is When We Die, Extraordinary Experiences at Life's End. Dr. Doka is an editor of both Omega, the Journal of Death and Dying and Journeys, a newsletter to help in bereavement. Dr. Doka was elected president of the Association for Death, Education, and Counseling in 1993. In 1995, he was elected to the board of directors of the International Work Group on Dying, Death, and Bereavement and served as chair from 1997 to 1999. Dr. Doka is an ordained Lutheran minister and a licensed mental health counselor. Well, welcome. I'm so Thank happy you. to have you have you with us. I'm honored so, to be here. So you're very interested in um, in dying, okay? Um, obviously, um, and in hospice, so in care before dying. Um, how did you get involved in all of this? Well, it, it was actually by accident. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was actually interested in juvenile delinquency, and. Um, as part of my training, we had to take what was called a clinical pastoral education semester. Um, and um, I had the perfect one planned. Um, I was gonna work at the Spofford Center in New York. The Spofford Center now closed was where New York City held its juvenile delinquents. So if you wanted to deal with uh, delinquency, that was where you found the creme de la creme of delinquency, if we can use that phrase. Um, and in any case, um, I was all set up uh, for it. I was planning to go. Uh, about a week before I was ready to leave St. Louis to go on to uh, to go back to New York where I live to work at the Spofford Center for the summer, um, I received a letter from the Spofford Center and, um, and I didn't even open it the first day because yeah, I thought it was just going to be one of these letters. It was in the midst of finals and final papers and all those kinds of things. And I thought it was going to be one of those letters that said, um, you know, on the first day, bring this, come here, report to this room. When I opened it the next day, when I had a, a breather, the next day I opened it and I was shocked. Um, my supervisor said, guess what? I've changed positions. Um, we no longer have a program at Spofford Center. We now have a, pro uh, but you can come with me to Sloan Kettering, of course, a major cancer hospital in New York, or you can be relieved of your obligation. Well, my whole academic plan uh, meant taking, a, uh, taking my CPE that summer. Uh, so I just kind of felt, well, I'll grin and bear it. And I uh, ironically found myself working with not delinquent children, but, but children who were ill and, and dying, and most of whom had, had one form of cancer or another, most of whom had leukemia at the time, which was, um, which was in those days a fatal disease. This was 50 years ago, literally 50 years ago. And that got me interested in the whole subject. I wrote my, I was going to St. Louis U University in, for a degree in sociology, and I wrote my master's thesis on um, on social organizational care in two terminal uh, in, in two pediatric hospitals, uh, and then um, in the seminary I wrote something on the pastoral care of dying children. So I found myself in sort of what I would call the second generation of people who were involved in the academic study of death and dying. And how do you mix your um, spirituality into you know this work that you're doing around death and dying? Well, you know, I, I, I think it's actually a very easy mix because, um, you know, um, well, let me put it another way. Actually, you know, as, as I began, and I say this in the book, uh, when we die, when, when I actually began working in the field, um, you began to see a lot of things that didn't always easily fit into your, um, your theology. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting and I just kind of observed and I'm sort of a non-judgmental type, so I didn't have to put all the, all the squares into all the boxes. I could sort of tolerate a little bit of dissonance. And do you believe that there is an afterlife? Oh, I always believe there's an afterlife. Um, I guess I'm just kind of interested now in seeing what it's really going to be like. So ha you've been around people who have left their body, died, gone on? Well, what we talk about in the book is, is a lot of different experiences. And again, these experiences have long been documented, some more than others. Um, um, you know, we could dispute what they mean, but for example, um, 
uh, there's been a long literature on um, on near death experiences where people have had near death experiences. There's a lot of uh, of research on what we call what I call post bereavement experiences, what other people call um, extraordinary experiences. The only reason uh, I don't call them, don't use like to use the word extraordinary experiences is that studies have shown about 60% of bereaved have an experience where they, um, for example, um, feel a sense of the person's presence, the deceased presence, or or hear or see or smell them or have dreams about them or uh, get a message from somebody else that really seems like it's coming from somebody uh, from the person who died or, um, or just have symbolic experiences. Um, one of my colleagues, Lou Legrand, who wrote, is now deceased but wrote extensively on that, uh, talked about the first incident that he ever had um, of these post bereavement experiences. And um, it was a woman he was counseling whose 16 year old son had died and she came into his office very excited and said, um, you know, Dr. Legrand, uh, I had the most incredible experience. She said, um, every day when I go to your office, I stop at the cemetery because it's in between, uh, you know, my house and your office. And I, uh, I stop at my son's graveside. And um, she said, when I went there today, there was a hawk perched on his memorial stone. And he didn't fly away right away. He kind of cocked his head and looked at me and then slowly flew away. And Lou Legrand said, and, and that has significance to you? And she said, um, my son's nickname was Hawk. Mm. Uh, my first experience in this was I was a young counselor, probably about 27, 28 years old. Um, I was counseling a woman whose uh, daughter had died about three years old from sudden infant death syndrome. And one of the mother's little rituals with her daughter was whenever she was going out, uh, she would put on her perfume, you know, this expensive perfume and her daughter would uh, want her to put some on her and she'd, you know, put a dab, uh, you know, on, on, on her daughter and um, her daughter would go around smell, you know, making everyone see how she smelled just like mommy, nice, just like mommy. And, um, and so when I was counseling her, we were, you know, talking about the fact of, uh, uh, we're struggling with the issue of, of bereavement and whether she should have more children. And, uh, and one day, and what had happened is uh, when her daughter died, uh, she anointed her daughter with the perfume and then put the bottle in the casket and switched to another brand because, you know, that, that perfume had such, um, such association with her daughter. And, um, and what happened then is that, um, she said, when she came to my office that day, she said, I, uh, I had the most incredible experience, she said, before I came to see you. Said, I went up to my daughter's room and the smell of perfume was all over the room. And she says, I even called my husband in and my husband smelled it as well. You know, I didn't say, what do you, you know, I didn't say, do you smell the perfume? She said, what do you smell? And he said, did you switch back to that, you know, that perfume? Um, and, um, and, you know, I was 27 years old, you know, uh, in my training, that was called an hallucination. Um, I, you know, didn't know what was going on here. If she was losing touch with reality, but she didn't seem to. And I, you know, and, and I guess in the midst of my confusion and and trying to figure out what was going on, I happened to ask the right question. I think I, I asked, "What did that experience mean to you?" She said, it "Was my daughter's way of telling me she was okay." Yeah, that's beautiful. And what? That's, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And soon after that, she finished therapy and uh, terminated therapy, and she went on and had four more children. So do you, are you ever present when some of these people are actually letting go and, and passing and dying? Or are you- I, I've, been at, I, I've been there at times, yes. So um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, as well as um, many hospice nurses I have been around and oncologists, have talked about seeing the soul as it leaves the body. Have you ever experienced anything like that being with someone who's passing? Um, no, I, I've never experienced anything like that, but I've, I've seen people uh, who were dying reach out um, suddenly. Um, you know, in the book, I write about terminal lucidity. Terminal lucidity is where people who have been unconscious or even had dementia or comatose, um, will all of a sudden have moments of clarity right before their death. They'll wake up, um, they'll speak very clear. 
Uh, one of the first instances of that was, was in Germany, documented instances of that was almost 150 years ago in Germany, um, where about 120 years ago in Germany, where um, a, to, a physician talked about his case of Katie Elmer, a woman who had um, very, very severe uh, mental retardation, never spoke. And then right before her death, all of a sudden awoke and sang a coherent song of her own dying. Uh, it had a remarkable experience on him, um, and potentially a very dangerous one. Um, he bitterly opposed uh, Hitler's plan to euthanize the mentally retarded as a result of that experience um, and criticized it as saying, no life is not worth living. Um, so you know, it had a remarkable impact. The other thing that I've experienced is what's called nearing death awareness. And this has been based on research by Callanan and Kelly where people will often communicate the nearness of death. So you may have somebody who's lying in a bed who you know, can't move and says, oh, I have to catch that plane tomorrow. Or, um, or I just saw grandma and you're thinking yeah, grandma that's died. A common. Yeah. yeah. Um, or the one that I had with my father when he was dying is some people will just, um, just talk about dying. My father was in hospice care. He knew fully what that meant. Um, he knew he was dying. Uh, he knew he was dying for about six months. Uh, and only the last six weeks were, you know, he was really bed bound. But uh, one day he woke up um, and said, am I dying? And he wasn't asking the question, do I have a life threatening illness that's going to kill me? He was really asking a question, am I actively dying? And my mother called me up and said, you know, what's going on here? And I talked to my father. And I said, um, you know, what's, what's going on, dad? I said, do you feel any pain? Do you feel any discomfort? He said, no, he said, I just, just feel different. I, I feel like I'm dying. And so my brother and sister and I hurried home and we spent the day with him sitting and reminiscing and talking. Uh, and then about eight o'clock that night, he said, I'm really tired. And, um, and I think we should all go to our own bedrooms and, and go to sleep. I uh, feel, said he felt better now. Um, but then he died that night. And uh, my sister always felt bad that we didn't stay. But I kind of thought, you know, as I looked at it, I thought he needed us there, but he couldn't leave while we were still there. Yeah. He needed some know, distance. It's, it's, it's interesting how it works. You know, I mean, through my work, I hear these stories all the time. But, sure. you know, um, my father, you know, had um, liver cancer and he was very sick for two years. And two weeks before he died, he started to talk about his mother, seeing his mother was in the room. Um, this is very common because oh, it's they, very common. they come in to kind of open up that path that leads us to the other side, you know, heaven or paradise or that other dimension, whatever you want to call it. And yeah. before my father died, so he was in hospice um, and he would not pass until the entire family was there. Like he waited for his brother. And then he literally, he was in a coma, held up one hand, like up to heaven, put his hand down and stopped breathing. Okay. You know, so, um, you know, there's, there's, there's something so remarkable about our consciousness, you know, during the soul consciousness, I believe at that time. And when my father passed, I mean, more than one of us saw the energy leave his body, which mm -hmm. is, you know, when I tell people death is really beautiful, you know, I mean, I was sad, I grieved him, um, but, you know, I knew where he was going. I saw it, which was really, you know, something else. And I think it's a personal experience for, for everybody, you know, no matter, you know, who's dying in your life. So sure. I take it that all of these, um, all of these things you're speaking about um, led you to your book, When We Die. Did they inspire yeah, actually, actually, what happened is I don't know if you ever come across Terry Daniel. Mm -hmm. Do you know her? Um, I know of her. Okay. She runs an afterlife conference. And about um, six or seven years ago, she called me up. Um, I hadn't met her by that point in time. She said, I'd, I'd like you to be a speaker at our conference and told me about the conference. And, you know, and I consider myself a pretty solid academic. And I said, you know, Terry, I said, I'm. I'm really not sure if I'm the person to speak on this, um, you know, and, and she convinced me and she was very um, persuasive and pervasive. Um, you know, she, she kept pushing and why don't you just try it out? And, you know, and I went there and I gave what um, I considered to be a very even handed kind of thing, you know, 
this is what people have experienced. This is what people have reported. And much like I do in the book, you know, there are various attempts to explain it in, you know, in, 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 in various kinds of ways from the scientific to the more mystical. And, you know, and, and as I said, a lot of the people there were, um, uh, were people who really were very deeply interested in this. And I wasn't sure how it would come across. And I was really very pleased and very surprised at how supportive people were and how open they were to that kind of approach. And that's when I thought, you know, I should, I, this might be an interesting thing to write about and to really explore this. And, um, and, and to really say, you know, look at, this is what we know about the experiences that people report. Um, you know, you can find your own way. Here are some explanations for it. Um, you can choose which one makes sense to you, but we cannot dispute that these kinds of experiences happen. We can argue about what's behind them, but, but certainly the, the, the data for, you know, they've been reported throughout history. Um, and, um, and across cultures and in all kinds of research. So, you know, that, that people experience in them, that people experience them, you can't argue. Yeah, that's interesting. So to give me an example of one of the ways it's perceived. Well, you know, um, you know, you, well, you can look at near death experiences, uh, for example, and, you know, and, um, there are people who think it's a physical, you know, the, and you find, you find people, you know, claiming, well, there's, it's just physiological. It's the, it's the, it's, it's a physiological defense to the, to the, the threat of dying to people who say, no, it really is, um, it is a gateway and, and a person has experienced a gateway. So you can find everything from the physiological to the spiritual as given, as given an explanation, um, you know, um, but that people have near death experiences is an indisputable. Yeah. So we've had, um, Dr. Evan Alexander on twice. And um, it's interesting because, I mean, he's a neuro, you know, a, neuro, a neurosurgeon. Yeah. So, you know, um, as God would have it, we have a neurosurgeon who had an NDA, which is yeah. pretty interesting um, because he disputes, you know, what science has said all along because he can speak scientifically through it. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think it's opened everybody's eyes now. And, you know, the, the amount of, even when I was on Dr. Oz, you know, um, I remember being on Dr. Oz and doing two segments on people who had NDEs, you yeah. know, I mean, and there's, there's similarities between all of them. You know, sure. I, I think it's just, you know, a way to make credible that there is something, a force that is pulling us um, and it's, and we shouldn't be afraid, you know, because they all come back saying, you know, either I wanted to stay there or I felt I had to come back for some reason or I was sent yeah. back. So it, it's really, um, it's really kind of interesting because I feel like so many people find the whole concept of, you know, their death very frightening. So what can you, how can you um, speak to like the, that proposition that's scaring, that frightening peace that people feel around their own death and around the death of their relatives as well. Like, where sure. did you go? Did you go into the abyss? You know, that. Yeah, kind of and I, I will have to say that in, in some of my work, I have found people who, and, and I would agree with you totally, most people, and the research would also support this, most people have, ND, have near death experiences that are, um, that really are transforming um, and very positive. And, and you find that after their anxiety about death is much, much less. Ernst Becker once wrote a wonderful book called The Denial of Death. And he says, that you, as humans, we're, we have a peculiar paradox. He said, we, you know, we have uh, the bodies of worms in the sense that we're, you know, we have a natural body that functions in a natural way. He said, but we have the minds of, uh, of angels. We can't, um, we can't think, it's hard to imagine your own demise, your own death. You know, we, um, we, we, we look toward eternity um, and that may be, there may be a reason for that, obviously. Um, but, um, but I think the unknown is, is terrifying to many people. I think the separation is terrifying to many people. You know, we, we're separating from a, and a, a world we, we um, we know uh, a word that's familiar with us and we don't know what's on the other side or even for some people, if there's another side. I probably the best experience that I ever had with, with somebody explaining that 
was um, when I was at Sloan Kettering, there was a young boy who was dying of, of leukemia, about eight years old. Um, and he, he was well aware of the fact that he was dying. And he asked his mother, you know, what, what's, what's heaven going to be like? And, and, you know, and, and one of the family stories about this boy was that um, he, was, he was late in being born. And she said, you know, do you remember when, you know, we, we've told you that you, you know, you, you took a long time to come out of the womb. You know, we always joke that you were very comfortable there and didn't want to leave. He said, would you like to go back now? And he said, you know, eight year old, oh, God, no, you know. Um, and she said, well, I, I think when we get to the other side, when we get to heaven, that's what it's going to be like. You're in a different world and, and it's, you know, and as comfortable as this world is, you, to you now, it's not one you'd ever want to go back to. Just like, you know, the womb can be very comfortable and supportive and all your needs are met, but you, you really didn't want to go back to that. I think that's a beautiful way of explaining it. Yeah. So can you speak to, and this is a hard question about why children die? Um, I wish I could. Um, I wish I had an answer to that. Uh, and so many times when I was at Sloan Kettering, I was, I was asked that question. Um, you know, and another wonderful book is, is C.S. Lewis's book. Um, have you ever read it, A Grief Observed? Yeah, I'm a grief counselor. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you know A Grief Observed? Yeah. Um, oh, that's wonderful. Um, so am I. <laughs> um, but, you know, but, but he talks about the fact that, you know, that as uh, if we're theistic, if, if we believe in a God, we're often caught in a paradox between, you know, God's omnipotent, He's in control, and at the same point in time, um, uh, he, he's good, and and so that becomes a, a problematic question. If God is is good and omnipotent, why are these terrible things happening? Why are these awful things happening? And C.S. Lewis's answer is probably the best I've ever read. Um, you know, because he and 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 if you remember, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Once the Problem of Pain, mm -hmm. and he later said the problem with the problem of pain was that I never experienced pain when I wrote it. And then when his wife died, um, and remember his story, he was a bachelor, he never expected to marry, he fell deeply in love, um, you know, loved the single academic life, and then all of a sudden was thrust into a relationship with an adolescent son that was anything but peaceful, um, and, um, and, and fell deeply in love with her, and, and deeply in love with the concept of family and, and his family. And when she was dying, he wrote, this was his journal. And, you know, and he wrote things like, where is God when you really need him? This is C.S. Lewis, the great Christian apologist, you know, a door slammed in your face. Later, he was able to say, it was my own frantic need that slammed that door. But, but what he comes to the conclusion of is that he's able to say, I believe in God's omnipotence. I believe in God's goodness. And I don't have a clue why I suffered like I did or why my wife suffered like I did. It's, you know, see, he embraces the mystery of death, so to speak. And says, you know, but when I get to the other side, I'm I'm going to have a conversation with him about it. Well, can and you, I guess that's what I would say. Can you accept as a Lutheran minister that a young child um, would pass because they've completed whatever they had to complete in this lifetime on a soul level? Um, You know, it, it doesn't fit easily into my theology. It doesn't even fit easily into my grief counseling. If a, if if you came to me and said, as a as a bereaved parent, this is what I I think happened, I would say, you know, I would probably reinforce that and say, I'm I'm glad that brings you comfort. I don't think I would ever offer that to a parent, because I think a, a parent would say, a, a many of the parents that I I have dealt with and I've dealt with a number of them over the years would say. Um, well, he might have been finished, but I wasn't. Yeah, but that's okay. That's no, okay. This, because that's not when you're grieving, no, it doesn't necessarily. Have, if the great reward is heaven, what? I mean, I have clients that have a separation between themselves and God, you know, who walk into churches and cry, okay, because they feel, I remember at a soul level what it was like to be with God and I want to be with God. So right. if the great reward, if we live every day to be in that realm of pure love and with divinity, then if a child 
you know, passes at a young age because they've completed. And so their reward is going on to the most wonderful thing that we could ever conceptualize. You know, I think that's a wonderful thing. I also work with an awful lot of people who have lost children, whether it's suicide, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. I'm writing a book on suicide or ODing or disease. And there's nothing you can say that's ever going to take away the pain of losing a child. There's nothing worse in this world. You know, I hear everything and there's nothing worse in this world. But, um, you know, it's not about, I'm, you know, I was asking you more about, you know, if you can get your heads around, around that, not so much the people you're talking to, because I think when we're grieving, you know, it's about, it's a lot of times it's about us. I'm, I'm angry. You left me. Not about it's, the person that passed. Yeah, I, I guess I'm comfortable accepting the mystery of it. Okay, well, I understand that. <laughs> um, I, I get it, you know. Um, so um, is there any way that you think we can learn to approach death with um, an open mind or the process of death? What, what do you mean with an open mind? Like, you know, looking at death, getting out of that scary place, saying that, you know, there's, there's a reason for this. You know, there's, you know, it's, it's part of life. You know, what is this all about from either, um, you know, your pastoral education or your academic sure. education? You know, I, I think, certainly I think one of the things we, we can do is have much less anxiety about it. And, you know, and I think that it deeply is rooted in our spirituality about our beliefs, about what we think is gonna happen after. And I think there are people, and I would hope, you know, uh, that when my time comes, I would be one of those who um, who can approach it with without great fear um, and and maybe with hope and, um, and even a thought of what's, you know, uh, a, a maybe even excitement. Um, but I, um, you know, uh, but I think that's a very individual equation. Um, I don't know if I answered your question there. No, no, you did. So what do you hope readers take away from? The um, I guess I hope they take away um, a, a sense of, of, of deep appreciation of, of the kinds of experiences that people can have um, as they deal with that. I ho hope they take away some practical skills um, in terms of um, you know, uh, you know, when your dad says I'm, I'm going to die or I saw grandma, you know, uh, that you, you use those moments to uh, to really say what you need to say. You, you recognize that this may be one of your last communications and that this knowledge that death is is imminent may be his last gift to you. Um, and, and this is a time um, to say what you feel you need to say. Um, one of the things about my dad's death was there was really no unfinished business, you know, uh, as I sat really literally by his deathbed, you know, we, we talked and I talked about all the, the great experiences we shared. And my father said, you know, I always felt bad that I never took you to a ball game, you know, because he was at the height of his business experience, you know, business at that point in time. And I said, Dad, I hated to go to ball games. That'll be one of the things I'll say in your, your eulogy. He never made me go to a ball game. And we laughed at that. Uh, but it was true, you know, and, and these are, these can be wonderful moments um, when families say what they need to say and express their sentiments and express their caring. And their, so I hope they take away that and appreciation of these moments. Um, and, um, and, and I hope they take away a sense of history and I hope they read the material and say, and what is it that I believe now? Um, and what are my explanations for these? Yeah, that's, uh, and I think that we're at a time now when we are experiencing so much death. Oh, yes. COVID, you know, loss. Unfortunately. Of, not just personally, but nationally and globally, like it hangs in the air, you know? I mean, I hate to say we're getting used to it, but there's an element of, okay, we're at 400,000 deaths in this country. It's, it, they, it becomes just a number. You know, that we've, I, you know, in my lifetime, I've never experienced that before, you know, so um, I, these kind of books are, are very, very, very much needed. Um, I interviewed um, a Catholic priest um, recently who is a practicing Catholic priest, um, and he wrote a book um, about helping people who have died tragically 
cross over. And one of the questions I asked him was, how does you know the the church accept that? And surprising to me, they do. Okay. Yeah. So what I want to ask you is, um, how are you accepted by by your church and putting this forward? And um, like, does the book follow like what your religion's doctrine is, or is it contrary to it? You're gonna get re get get me in some trouble now, I think. Uh, but uh, but I think the answer is um, that I think. Um, I don't know if every Lutheran clergyman who read this book would, would agree with it. Um, I don't think I say anything contrary, um, but I think I display a kind of, um, let's, let's look at this that might make some people who want answers feel very uncomfortable. No, well, you know what? That's part of, that's part of what it's all about. And, and to me, that's not a problem. Exactly. That's part of what it's all about. Like you can't, not everybody's going to think the way you do and yeah, follow, yeah. follow, but if you can add a little comfort to whatever it is, then um, then you're doing your job as a human being on this planet. That's that's what I would agree. That's, yeah, that's what it's all about. Where can people buy your book? Well, they can buy it um, in any. Uh, they can probably, if it's not in a bookstore, I'm sure they can order it from a bookstore. Certainly, it's available online uh, through Amazon and through all of those kinds of outlets. Um, and uh, I'd like to tell them it's a good read. Um, and do you have a website that you would like people? I do have a website, which is um, www.drkendoka.com. Just one word, drkendoka.com. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank I you, Anne. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, and to all my listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please like, share, and comment. And be sure to subscribe to our channels so you never, ever, ever miss an episode. So thank you. Thank you.